Today we're turning to two passages of scripture, both from the gospel according to Luke. We're going to go back. We preached from Luke chapter 3 several months ago, but we need to go back there because there's kind of a hanging situation with John the baptizer or John the Baptist that leads into our key passage for today, which is Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 23. Uh, we'll pick up the second part of this central segment of Luke chapter 7 in two weeks. I'm delighted Cam Beatty will be with us next week to preach, uh, but we'll come back to where we are next, next Sunday as well. Now, hear now God's word, Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 20. First. Now, as the people were expectantly looking and all were questioning in their hearts about John, whether he, John, might be the Messiah, the Christ. John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but the one who comes, the one who comes, is mightier than I, of whom I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Then with many other exhortations, he, John, preached good news to the people. But when Herod the Tetrarch, that's Herod Antipas, being reproved by him concerning Herodias, his brother's wife, and concerning all the evil things that Herod had done, added yet this to them all. He also locked up John in prison. Now to Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 23, and understand John is still in prison all these months and maybe even a year or so later. So picking back up the story, Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 23. And the disciples of John reported all these things, all these things that Jesus had been doing, including the miracles that we talked about the last couple Sundays. And the disciples of John reported all these things to him, to John. So calling two of his disciples to him, John sent them to the Lord. That means to Jesus. It's Luke's title now he's using for Jesus, the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for, shall we expect another? And when the men had come to him, to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for, shall we expect another. In that hour, he, this is Jesus, healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And to many who were blind, he gave sight. And answering, he said to them, to the two disciples of John, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended by me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. I don't know how many of you have done a hard time in prison. I, I would ask for a show of hands, but this... Uh, this service is being recorded. You might be recorded. Um, I don't know how many of you have served time, uh, maybe just been locked up for a night or two in the Starkville jail, the way Johnny Cash was. Were any of y'all there the night Johnny Cash was in the jail here? Some of you tell me, no, no, okay. Uh, well, let me just tell you this. For the, Gwen, you've never, you've never done hard time, have you? For the, for when you're in prison and for the prisoner, time slows down. Time really slows down. And you ruminate and you cogitate on maybe major mistakes that you made. And if only, if only this hadn't happened. 
If only I hadn't gone to that party with her or with him. If only I hadn't gotten involved in that group. If only my daddy or my mommy had been better to me. If only. It's her fault. It's their fault. And maybe if you're, let's just say, open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, at a certain point you come to conviction about your own self and your own soul. But time slows down for the prisoner. And here's the question that is before prisoners. And you may be interrupting me and saying, Martin, I've not done, <laughs> I haven't been in a maximum security prison before. I haven't even done time in the Starkville jail. But let me just ask you to expand your connection point here. If you've ever been very ill for a day or a week or several weeks, if you've ever been so to speak, stuck in a hospital, receiving gracious care and everything, but you really don't want to be in the hospital. Most of the people I go to visit in the hospital, this may surprise you, don't actually want to stay in the hospital. Most people I go to see in the ICU with all the lines running through their veins don't want to stay in the intensive care unit with all the lines running into their veins. If you've ever been in that kind of situation or been with somebody who was in that situation, time slows down. You remember? Time slows down. When you're waiting to see if they will say yes or no, when you've sent in all those applications and you haven't heard back, students, sometimes time slows down there. Is she breaking up with me or not? I'm waiting to hear back. I sent a text three days ago. I haven't heard back time slows down. And here's your question, and here's the question for the prisoner too, whether you're literally a prisoner or a prisoner of a certain situation. Is this going to lead to impatience or inspiration? And that's really part of the question before us today. What are you going to do with disappointments and dead ends and detours in your life. Impatience or inspiration. You know, I've spent some time in recent months at the Walnut Grove Correctional Facility, uh, a maximum security prison here in Mississippi. No, just to set your mind at ease, although there's certainly God can redeem uh, me and all people, but just in case you're, I'm not a convicted felon. I'm not, I haven't done violent crimes, but I've spent some time in the Walnut Grove Correctional Facility. If you're part of this church family, you know this is now part of our local and regional mission that, that we're involved with, and I do Kairos ministry, um, ministry outreach, evangelism, and worship with the guys who are in this maximum security prison down at Walnut Grove. I was there about three weeks ago, and one of the prisoners who is now has, has graduated up to, he's a trustee, and his trustee role is he's specifically the lead chaplain for the Christian ministry and the church in Walnut Grove. You know, there, there are over 500 men who are doing long-term sentences at the Walnut Grove Maximum Security Correctional Facility. This is a, a guy named Elliot, and God has really brought a lot of redemption and change in Elliot's life. He's an excellent brother in the faith, an excellent ministry leader, but he was sharing with me frustration with the fact that because they are so understaffed at this maximum security prison, and by the way, you're kind of in the middle there, that's when you go through the yard, you know, there's gates and locked doors and electronic doors when you go through the first staging system and checkpoint systems through several locked doors, and you go through this yard, and you can see it's not like a normal playground, okay? And then, and then you get to the second segment of doors and bars and checkpoints. Um, Elliot was sharing with me because the staffing is so low at this place. I mean, they've got the cameras, they've got the barbed wire, they've got the fences, they've got the lock, locking gates, all this kind of stuff that you go through. You've visited people in prison, I'm guessing some of you have. You know, this is, this is like a smaller version of what I used to do in Florida. But it's a pretty locked down facility, but they don't have much staff. And because they're so understaffed, the warden of the prison uh, about a month ago made the declaration, the determination, 
that uh, they couldn't have big church anymore. There's over 500 men in this uh, facility and they were having upwards of 60 people, 60 of the men come to church, the prison led, prisoner led church on Sunday. And the warden said it's a security problem. He doesn't have enough staff. And so he's limiting church to no more than 30 prisoners on a given Sunday. That's a pretty challenging situation. Just kind of cogitate on that. Does, does that sound like a great decision to you? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, Elliot was frustrated, but he's trusting God to work through this. The question is, is he going to become impatient about this or seek the inspiration of the Lord in the midst of this? Speaking with another one of the chaplains, another prisoner who's a chaplain, not the lead chaplain like Elliot. This, this man is a great, great guy, but he's at a different what I would consider kind of spiritual maturity level, he had just gotten out of um, solitary confinement. He was in solitary confinement this summer because in the late spring, he assaulted another prisoner. Uh, this is a chaplain now, a guy who's a professing Christian. He assaulted another prisoner, and so he was locked into solitary confinement, which is zone seven out at Walnut Grove uh, for the summer. And he was so happy to be out, and he told me about how God had worked on his heart and his mind during his time in solitary confinement. The way it works in solitary confinement, you're only out for an hour each day and you're chained up when you're out for an hour each day and otherwise you're just in a little cell. You got a lot of time. The time really slows down when you're in solitary. Solzhenitsyn, a great um, Christian and Russian writer of the last century, when he wrote one of his magisterial works, uh, the Gular Archipelago, uh, gave thanks for and blessed his decades, you know, in the Siberian prison. Can you imagine that? He says this, in the Gulag Archipelago, he wrote this, bless you prison. Gradually, this is inspiration now, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes of people, nor between political parties, but right through every human heart. The line between good and evil passes through your heart and my heart, is what he's saying, through all human hearts. And then he says this also, bless you, prison. Bless you for being in my life, for there, lying on the rotting prison straw, I came to realize that the object of life is not prosperity, as we are made to believe, but the maturity of the human soul. So think about your times of waiting and not being in the situation you want to be in. Maybe illness, maybe not getting the marriage you thought you were going to get, maybe losing a spouse, maybe being in a different stage or place. What have you learned? What are you learning? Are you listening to God, the Holy Spirit, speak into your life and into your soul? What about your times of waiting? Impatience? or inspiration. Well, turning back to our scripture for today, we remember the pretty stark situation John finds himself in. And let me remind you, John, uh, during his young adult and adult life, was an itinerant, wild man prophet. He lived out freely in the desert or the wilderness. He wore camel's hair clothing. Everybody remember about John the Baptist? If you've, if you've been in children's Sunday school, you know about John the Baptist. He ate locust and honey. This is a man who went where he wanted to, when he wanted to, did what he wanted to. You understand what I'm saying. This is your true outdoor dude prophet. Baptizing people in rivers. Coming out of the middle of nowhere. And now this wilderness prophet is imprisoned by evil, evil Herod the Tetrarch, Herod Antipas, who has authority. He gets a portion, he got a portion of his dad, Herod the Great's little kingdom underneath the Roman Empire. 
Um, Herod Antipas has control of Galilee, as well as over what we would call part of central Jordan, among other places. The evil guy, bad guy. And John, because he's a righteous prophet, and nobody could tell him to be quiet, John made the impolitic move of speaking publicly against Herod Antipas and his adulterous relationship with his half-sister Herodias, who used to be married to one of Herod's other brothers, but she left that brother to come live with this half-brother and be his wife. Does this sound like a nice family to y'all? So um, Herodias is in this new so-called marriage with her half-brother Herod Antipas, and it's adulterous on top of all the incest involved in it, and Herod is confronted by John the Baptist speaking out publicly against him and calling him to conviction. And Herod caves to the pressure of Herodias, apparently, and has John arrested. If you know the rest of the story, when you piece together the other Gospels, you know at the end of the day, uh, Herodias is going to, through her daughter Salome, and the dance at the big banquet when Herod Antipas makes this rash promise, I'll give you half of my kingdom, um, she asks for John's head on a platter. And they behead John and bring out the head on the platter in the middle of the great festivities. We're not quite there yet. We're on the way there. John's been in prison a long time in Macarius. Let me show you Macarius. I think we've got it. Yeah. So there it is. It's over in what we would call Jordan, overlooking the Dead Sea in central um, in, in Moab, okay, um, so it's in central Jordan. This is, this is there you see, it's one of the great four, uh, fortress fortifications that Herod's daddy, Herod the Great, built. Some of you know Masada, this is similar, okay, Makaros, overlooking the Dead Sea. Looks pretty there, you see the archeological um, site there on the big mount. But John wasn't enjoying the view because John was in a dungeon down below the palace area. So that's where John has been spending his last number of months in that dungeon, chained up in that dungeon below the palace of the evil king. Where is God in all this? John the Baptist might ask, you might ask, and certainly John's going to ask Jesus about it and specifically go to Jesus. Now, during this time, when John's there in this dungeon, Jesus, if you want to be critical of Jesus, is wandering around aimlessly in Galilee, preaching to a bunch of peasants and people who are not significant, seemingly, ultimately, in the economy of God. He's, you know, arguably wasting his time, wasting months as John rots away in this dungeon. Jesus is miraculously bestowing grace on people who really have seemingly no claim on God at all. Even, and this is, we're supposed to pick up on this, when John hears about all these things, and the last things that just happened is, you know, remember this, Jesus has just, on behalf of a Gentile, I mean, I'm talking about an uncircumcised Gentile, folks, a Gentile centurion, because of his appeal, Jesus has healed a Gentile servant or slave of the Gentile centurion. And then after that, Jesus goes to this town that's not even mentioned in the entire Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, named Nain, a little village out of the way. And Jesus spends a day there, going there, and raising from the dead the son of a poor widow that we've never heard of. We're not dealing with the Roman Empire here, folks. We're not dealing with the governors and the political parties and the chief priests in, in Jerusalem. We're wandering around Galilee bringing saving grace to people you've never heard of. And John's writing in the prison. This is our situation. Jesus is not delivering prompt judgment on the chaff the way John promised. Jesus is not delivering political revolution and overthrowing Herod and the Roman Empire. Jesus is not delivering freedom even for John stuck in this dungeon. What is going on? Remember John? Luke 3, verse 9. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. I'm the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. He is coming, and when he comes, the axe is already at the root of the tree, and those that are rotten will be cut down now. 
This is John the Baptist. Luke 3.17, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff, the sinners, the evil ones, he will burn with an unquenchable fire. And it ought to have been done yesterday, the way John would surely see it. So John deputizes two disciples. If, you're, if you know your Old Testament, catch this. I had not noticed this before. I was reading through this this week. It's like, oh, wow. Yes, this is even tenser than I thought. We have two witnesses. We have two witnesses under Deuteronomy, under Deuteronomic law. John is challenging Jesus to two witnesses to make a legal determination whether Jesus is, in fact, God himself who has come on the high end or a false prophet on the condemnation end. Do not miss this. John is really challenging Jesus. He sends two witnesses. This is a legal dispute that's at play here. He sends this delegation to question or to push Jesus on his identity, on his person and his work. You know we're saved by the perfect person of Jesus and the perfect work of Jesus. If you know your Reformed theology, you know this, right? If you know your biblical theology, you know this. John's going to challenge Jesus' person and his work. Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for, shall we expect another? Now, this is the same verb that we read back in Luke 3 about the people expecting or looking for the Messiah. But John is deeper than the people. John understands that if Jesus is who John thought he was, not just the Messiah, he is the Lord God himself who has come in the flesh because John says, Isaiah 40, I'm the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the highway, because the Lord actually comes on earth. Do you hear what I'm saying? We're either going to go really high here with John, not just the Christ, but God himself, Isaiah 40, which John the Baptist has already invoked as the core of his ministry, or false prophet. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for, expect another? In other words, where's the kingdom? When I evangelize with Jewish people, often, you may, you, I'm sure if you've talked with Jewish people who are fairly well-educated, they'll oftentimes ask you the question, where's the golden age of the Messiah, if Jesus is the Messiah? We've been waiting 2,000 years on this since he came. Y'all claim he's the Messiah, and you know you have to be equipped to deal with those conversations, right? So here it is here. Where is the kingdom? Now, notice we have this huge juxtaposition of the faith of the Gentile centurion. When Jesus says, we're supposed to catch this, in chapter 7, verse 9, I emphasize this, go back to the sermon from two weeks ago. Whose faith amazes Jesus, right? And it's the Gentile, uncircumcised centurion. And Jesus says, I say to you, Luke 7, 9, I say to you, not even in Israel... Okay, let's go back and think about this. Not even among the greatest prophet of Israel's history, John the Baptist. See? Not even in Israel have I found such great faith. So you've got a Gentile centurion on the one hand who has great faith, and you have Israel's greatest prophet who is highly frustrated. What do you do when things don't go your way? Faith? Or frustration. Now, you can say, well, the different personalities. No, no, no. John and the centurion are both type A's. But the centurion says, I don't care. I don't deserve to have you come to me. I don't deserve to have you answer to me. But please, if you'll just say a word, I know you command life and death. I get it. I mean, I don't know exactly all the theology, but I get that you have power over life and death and over disease the same way I can boss soldiers around. You have that centurion's faith, and you have John, who's highly frustrated and impatient with Jesus. Now, notice Jesus gives a twofold answer. This is consistent with what Luke has been telling us all the way through the gospel. Jesus is powerful in what? Deed and word. Jesus is powerful in deed and in word. So here it is, um, the deed. Luke 7, 21, we get it in one verse, and man, it is an awesome verse. So they come as legal witnesses to push Jesus to declare, 
and to be forced into a situation. And in that hour, Jesus is going to respond. Let me point out one other thing about John doing this. Who else has pushed Jesus on his identity, really pushing him? The devil. Who else is going to really push Jesus on his identity as we move to the close of the gospel? The chief priest who accused Jesus and hand him over to Pilate. Do you really want to be in the company of the devil and the chief priest who turned Jesus over to Pilate to be crucified? Probably not, but John is the third. <laughs> He's the middle one of this trio in this sequence of pushing Jesus. In that hour, an incredible display of kingdom saving grace, restoration power. Can you imagine being there in that little you know, day when they show up and immediately in response, here's one of Jesus' answers. Before he even talks, notice what he does. In that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. Many people. And many who were blind, he gave sight. Right in front of these witnesses, judges <laughs> from John the Baptist. Now let's go to verse 22. Now he speaks. It says, deed and word. He answered them, go and tell John what you have seen. In other words, what I've just done and what you've heard. Now, I've got this numbered for you. I'll come back to this. I really want you to catch this because this struck me in understanding this passage kind of in a different way as I looked at it this past week. The blind receive sight. Notice that. You notice the way I have that highlighted. That's number one, right? Blind receive sight. This is Jesus' words. Now, the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. That's number three in Jesus' words. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have good news preached to them. If we have six in the Bible, Bible students, what do we need to get to? Six to seven. So that's the issue that's going to be before us here. Jesus is laying this out very clearly from a scriptural legal standpoint. You have to understand this. This is really, Jesus is so deep, it's incredible. Um, so John is like, well, number seven should be you now bring the judgment. Because Jesus, with these passages, is quoting from Isaiah all over the place, right and left. Isaiah 29, 18, Isaiah 42, 7a, and Isaiah 42, verse 18, numbers 1 and 4 that I lined up for you. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, 1, 2, 4. Isaiah 26, verse 19, number 5. Isaiah 29, verse 19, and Isaiah 61, that Jesus reads in Nazareth, the beginning of verse 1. That's number 6. Good news preached, okay, to the poor. Jesus declares, I fulfilled all six. And John's like, okay, bring on seven, which is the vengeance of the Lord. John is impatiently demanding, but what about Isaiah 34, the judgment on the nations? John is impatiently demanding, what about Isaiah 61, uh, verse 2, uh, B, Proclaim the day of vengeance of our God, or even simply for John's immediate sake. What about Isaiah 42, second part of verse 7? Bring out prisoners from the dungeon. Or, if you like, 61, the last part of verse 1. Liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those bound. Give me that, John is saying. That's the seven that I want, and I want it now. You ought to do it now if you're a good God, if you're a good Savior. Jesus has declared his six marks. Where is his seven? It's the forgotten beatitude. It's the forgotten beatitude. It's unique beatitude. It's a challenge beatitude. You, you, you don't want to get out of loop without catching this. This is a bombshell and a call for real faith from us right in the middle of Luke 7. Notice this. Jesus says, here's his seven. After laying out these six things, Here's number seven. And blessed is he who is not offended by me. It's uniquely gracious, but challenging. And the question is, how are you going to respond to Jesus? It all has to do with our relationship with Jesus. Jesus is saying, stop looking out there, John. You look at me. Where are you with me? Stop looking at your chains in the dungeon. Stop looking at the situation that Rome hasn't been overturned or the corrupt authorities in Jerusalem haven't been overturned. You look at me. Where are you with me? 
blessed, this is singular, Makarios here, this is singular, let me make this very clear, this is very personal to John and to each one of us, to, each, to you. This is personal, this is singular, a singular beatitude here. Blessed is he who, singular, is not scandalized, does not stumble over me, is not offended by me. That's the Greek there. It's the word we get scandalized from. Blessed are the one who doesn't stumble over me and go to condemnation, but the one who comes to me. Jesus, in other words, has taken John out of those passages I just quoted and all the way back to Isaiah 8, verses 13 and 14. Look at this. Lord of hosts will be both a sanctuary on the one side and a stone of offense, a rock of stumbling, a scandal to all Israel. He's going to be one or the other to all Israel, either a sanctuary or a stumbling block. Who is he with you? Because Jesus has come. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of the heavenly armies has come. And so Jesus says, echoing Isaiah 8, and John, believe me, knows the scroll of Isaiah. He knows it backwards and forwards. Jesus has taken him to it. Blessed is he who is not scandalized by me. Isaiah 8. Come to me. Come to me, John. Take sanctuary in me. You will know all grace forever. This is a gospel warning and an invitation to anyone who is doubting Jesus and impatient with Jesus. I don't know if you've ever been there, if you're there right now. But this is a warning and an invitation. The forgotten beatitude, it's right there in John 7. To John, for us in Luke chapter 7. And this takes us to what Paul says. Where's your heart? Where's your mind? 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 16 and 17. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't see with the eyes of flesh. Even though we were once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And then Romans 12, 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. If you're in the dungeon, if you're on the deathbed, if you're in the ICU, if things aren't going the way you thought they were in school, I don't care what. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed. To this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, okay? Transformed in mind. This is the invitation to John. This is the gospel invitation to you and me as Christians. Giving up our presuppositions and our preconditions about God. This is the way God ought to do it. If there is a God, or I kind of believe in God, but man, he's messing up right now. God, you need to fix this now. Give up your presuppositions, your preconditions. John the Baptist, give up your preconditions, your presuppositions. Give up your time. I, I got you on a time. I've got you on time, God. You better come through. I control the watch. No, no, no. God creates time. You are just a creature under time. Get the relationship right here, friend. Jesus was amazed at the centurion's great faith. What about John's response? Well, to close out, this is a preview of arguably the greatest of Jesus' parables, the father with the two sons, otherwise known as the prodigal son. How does Jesus leave that story at the end? The younger son is restored and celebrated by the father's grace. You remember the older son who's so angry and frustrated? Where is he? He's outside and daddy says, please come in. You remember how Jesus leaves that parable? We don't know what the older brother is going to do. Luke doesn't give it here either for John. We're gonna, G Jesus is going to then go turn around and commend John. But the question is, what is John going to do? Because Jesus is saying, come into the party. Don't stumble over me in my grace. 
I bring the kingdom with grace in my first coming. Believe and receive. So also Christians with us, in the United States of America in 2023 heading into 2024, we're going to have choices too. And Jesus is saying, don't run it by your rules. Give yourself to my grace and come in. Will you? Come to Jesus, like the choir just sang. Come to Jesus and live. John the Baptist out there, come to Jesus and live. Doubter among us, frustrated among us, come to Jesus and live. He's the home. He's your salvation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.